Shanghai at dawn. China is on the rise. But just how fast is this country really changing? That's what I'm going to find out. Well, this is the start of my journey across China. This is Shanghai's Pudong International Airport. And from here on the east coast of China, I'm going to take a trip right across this huge country, about four and a half thousand kilometers. It's about 3,000 miles from Shanghai to Kashgar, a city in China's far west. Now, I've got a map here. Let's have a look to see exactly where I'm going to go. So this is where I am now in the city of Shanghai. And this is China's biggest, most populous and most prosperous city and the heart of China's new burgeoning economy. And from here, I'm going to travel inland to Anhui. It's poor and it's rural. And I want to look here at the lives of poor rural people, workers and farmers, what rights what freedoms do they enjoy under a system that is still controlled by the Communist Party? And from Anhui, I'm going to travel further inland, several hundred miles to the city of Yichang, the location of the world's biggest hydroelectric dam, the Three Gorges Dam, that's been built to provide electricity, power for China's huge economy. And in fact, all the way up the Yangtze River here, hundreds of new dams are being built. And now we're going to have a look at the environmental consequences of those dams, ending up here in Chengdu. And from here, I'm going to take a huge leap out, all the way out here to the far west, to the city of Kashgar. And this is a completely different China. People here are Muslim, and they really have very little in common with their communist masters in Beijing. But first, to the city of Shanghai. Shanghai seeks to impress. Dear passengers, welcome to take our maglev train. And that starts with its billion dollar airport train. 430, we're now at the top speed of this train. That's about 270 miles an hour. And this is pretty much the fastest form of transport on land anywhere in the world. Seven minutes later, you're in the city center. What a city it is. Shanghai's home to many of China's new millionaires. Uh, Developer Liu Taishun shows me his new fantasy land for those with a couple of million to spare. I certainly never expected to see this in a communist country. A marble bathroom and a bath with its own DVD player built in. I've never seen one of those before. I put it to Mr. Liu that most people in Britain would be amazed to find out that such houses exist in China. Even we've been surprised, he tells me. We didn't believe China could change so fast. Shanghai seems to change every week. People are making money, and they want to enjoy it. People like Joe Ding. Fifteen years ago, all he owned was a few sewing machines. Now, he's a multi-millionaire. His fortune has been built on textiles. And his story is the story of China. From nowhere 20 years ago, 
China has risen to become the world's biggest producer and exporter of clothing. In the past, he says, you had no choice but to work for the state all your life. Now, if you've got ambition, you can start your own company. There's nothing to stop you. The other key to China's success is its vast army of poor workers. 700 million of them. The workers here at Mr. Zhou's plant are clearly well looked after. Unfortunately, that's not the case for millions of other factory workers in China. In fact, just a few hundred meters from the factory gates here, there are workers from other plants who tell a very different story. It's one of squalor and hardship. The workers in this slum are all from China's countryside. There's no social security in China. And independent trade unions are banned. Liu Jixia sells pancakes here from her little stall on a street corner. But for years she worked in a textile plant, 15 hours a day, with only one day off a month. Finally, she tells me she'd had enough. I asked the boss for one day off to see my son, she says. I hadn't seen him for a year, but he refused. That was it. I thought even collecting rubbish is better than working in this factory. Still, millions of migrants flood into China's cities. At Shanghai Railway Station, others are heading home. It's a trip most will make only once a year. And along with them, it's time for me to leave Shanghai on the next leg of my journey. As you can see, it's always a bit of a struggle getting on a train in China because there's far more, more of us trying to get on the train than there are seats. Everybody wants to try and get one of those seats. So here we go. Hopefully I'll get one. Okay. Okay. So as you can see, this is a very different train from the one that we took in from the airport. Uh, but this is pretty much a normal train in China. And trains are the backbone of transportation in China. This is how most people get around this huge country, sitting for hours and hours on a hard seat. This train, for example, is going to Xi'an, a city in central China. And these people will be on the train for 16 hours overnight tonight. We fortunately are not going all the way to Xi'an. We're going to Anhui province, a few hours up the line from here. In Anhui, I've been promised a chance to see Chinese democracy in action. I'm taken in style in my own government convoy. So I've arrived now at a village in Anhui province and I've come here to witness a village election. They're about to hold an election in this village and to look at the whole issue of freedom in China. But as you can see, I'm being accompanied by a large number of Communist Party officials. As I'm shown around the village, there's no sign of the election, no posters, no pictures of candidates. My entourage in tow, I'm taken to meet a voter. Mr. Sun is also a Communist Party member. I put it to him that people in Britain wouldn't believe there was democracy in China. They're wrong, he tells me. China is very democratic, especially in villages like ours. We have democratic elections. 
and we're very happy. <laughs> Next, I'm taken to see the village office. I'm shown a list of the registered voters and the sealed ballot papers from the last village election. The officials are keen to show me that democracy here is real. But is it? The next day, I slip away, and in a nearby village, I meet a democracy activist. Yao Lifa was once an elected official. He's seen for himself how the system works. More than 90% of elections in China are a sham, he says. How can elections be free? This is a one-party state. The Communist Party controls the whole process. The Communist Party's claim that the people in this village enjoy the right to choose their own leaders appears to be pretty empty. So what about other rights? The Communist Party, for example, makes great claim to the idea that everybody in China enjoys equal protection under the law. <coughs> <laughs> Lawyer Zhou Li Tai has been testing that idea. Each morning, his office fills up with people hoping he can get them justice. Zhou is a champion of labor rights. In a back room, he shows me the files of the 5,000 cases that he's fought. China's labor laws are very good, he says. The problem is getting the courts to enforce them. The courts are often pressured by local governments and by their friends in the business community. When his clients can't get to him, he goes to them. So this is the house of uh, one of lawyer Joe's clients. He's a young man who lost his leg in an industrial accident. And tomorrow morning, uh, they're going to go to court to try and get compensation for him. <laughs> Wang Yutai is 32. Four years ago, he fell into a machine at the quarry where he worked. A hundred thousand workers are killed in industrial accidents in China every year. Countless more like Wan are left maimed. I'm determined to keep fighting for justice, he says. I've tried suing before, but I lost. But if the factory had been safe, this would never have happened to me. So I'm going to go on appealing. So for Wang Yutai, it's back to court. A chance to get justice. Twenty years ago, that would have been unthinkable. But there's still a long way to go. The sign on the building behind me here may say People's Court, but the fact is this building continues to serve the interests of one organization, the Chinese Communist Party. It controls the justice system and the judges who work in it. The few brave lawyers like Mr. Zhou, who seek to take on that power and authority, have the whole system, the whole pack of cards, stacked against them. But now I'm on the road again, heading further west. Well, I've now come several hundred more miles further up the, the Yangtze River, and I'm now in west of Hubei province in central China. And there's a very good reason why I wanted to come here, and that's to see this. The Three Gorges Dam, a massive wall of concrete over a hundred meters high and more than a mile across. 
For the last 10 years, it's been the world's biggest construction site. And soon, it'll have another entry in the record books. When this dam's finished, it will be, by quite some margin, the world's largest hydroelectric power station. And to give you an idea of what that means, it'll be able to produce the equivalent amount of electricity as 10 nuclear power plants. And for the Chinese government, that's obviously very good news. That will be cheap, clean electricity for China's surging economy. But there is another side to the story of this dam, and that is its immense cost. That cost lies upstream, in the vast area that's been flooded. Well, the weather really seems to have turned against us now. Uh, the cloud has closed right in, and as you can see, it's even started snowing. Uh, and that's a shame, because you can't see any of the scenery around here, which is really quite spectacular. Anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to head upstream from the Three Gorges Dam, uh, about 20 miles or so, uh, and what we're crossing here is in fact the world's largest man-made lake. It stretches back upstream from the dam for about 600 kilometers. That's about 400 miles. And when this dam was flooded, they had to move out more than a million people from their homes and villages and towns which were flooded out by the dam. And we're going to go now to a small town called Zigui. It used to be on the banks of the Yangtze River and is now beneath the surface, beneath the waves of this massive lake. This is all that remains of Old Zagwe, a few abandoned buildings. Mr Han and his family now live in a new town. But they still think of this as home. He doesn't know where his house is. He reckons, OK, over by the boat there, over by the boat there is, is where his house used to be. And where, where was the middle of the town? So the old town centre used to be down here, from that boat along here, that was the edge of the, the city, along the edge of the old, what was the river before, before it became a lake here. Now it's all beneath the water. Mr and Mrs Han take me for a walk up into what's left of the old town. Suddenly, Mr. Han comes across some old friends. <laughs> Apparently, they're still living here. And they're not the only ones. I asked this man why they've been left behind. If you're old like her, he says, or poor like me, you're stuck here. It's only people who work for the government who are given new homes. In the river valleys of western China, this story is being repeated hundreds of times. Switching to bus, we leave the Three Gorges behind. We're following a smaller river, and ahead is another dam. My guide is Professor Fan Xiao. He's a fierce critic of the dam-building frenzy. He says blocking all China's rivers like this will only add to its environmental woes. Take this dam, he says. Because of deforestation, the river is full of silt. Now all that silt will get trapped behind the dam. In less than 100 years, it'll be full up. Then what will we do?
For poor farmers like Mr. Wang, the issue is land. Behind his house, he shows me what used to be his fields. Soon, this will all be flooded, his livelihood gone. Mr. Wang was once a staunch supporter of the Communist Party. Not now. They don't care about us. They don't even look at us, he says. They're not bothered what happens to us ordinary people, how we'll survive. As I get up to leave, Mr. Wang's composure suddenly crumbles. <laughs> this is the human cost of flooding these valleys. Now for my big leap west to Kashgar via Urumqi. I've just arrived in Urumqi and it's minus 18 degrees Celsius here, but I'm still a long way from my destination. Kashgar is still another 700 miles further west. Finally. So these guys have been on the road two days and two nights. They've come about a, a thousand miles in the last two days, non-stop. We're about 20 miles from home now, so they're all very happy that they're nearly there. This is home, Kashgar. These are the Uyghur people. At the mosque, the men are attending Friday prayers. It's hard to believe that this is China. The Chinese government goes to great lengths to remind everybody here that this is an inseparable part of the Chinese motherland. Even here in the middle of this mosque, for example, take a look at this sign. All ethnic groups live friendly together here, it says. They cooperate to build a beautiful homeland and to support the unity of our country and to oppose ethnic separatism and illegal religious activities. And woe betide any who thinks and behaves differently. Nearby, Chairman Mao stares out across People's Square. 3,000 miles from Beijing, Kashgar's schoolchildren are drilled in patriotism. But the Uyghur people have almost nothing in common with their Chinese brethren. More than 8 million of them live out here along China's western fringe. Most can't even speak Chinese. I'm going to see one Uyghur farming family. Around here, this is the local taxi. I'm good. Abdullah Hat takes me to meet his family. They're sorting through the cotton harvest. I'm struck once again by just how different these people look. His granddaughter even has green eyes. Abdullah tells me he's never been outside Kashgar. 
I have family over the border in Kazakhstan, he says. I'd like to go and see them. I wouldn't mind going to Beijing, he says, but I can't speak Chinese, so it would be difficult to get around. Through our government interpreter, I ask Abdullah's son, Iminjan, if he feels Uyghur or Chinese. Of course, Chinese, he says. But he doesn't look comfortable. Today, Abdullah and his son are taking their sheep to market. Kashgar's market is one of the biggest in Central Asia. On a good day, more than 100,000 people turn out here. People here are afraid to speak freely. But away from the camera and the government minders, the message is clear. These people do not feel Chinese. So here I am at the end of my journey, 3,000 miles away from where I started in Shanghai. And what we've seen on that journey is that China today is a country of huge contradictions, a country where private individuals are free to accrue massive personal wealth, but where individual rights are still barely understood, and where the Communist Party still remains in absolute control of political power, even out here, a world away from the Chinese capital in Beijing. Cindy and Stuart survive the fire. Neighbours here on BBC One after the news. Then we head to the doctors at five past two. Ireland, unbreakable. France, unpredictable. England, unravelling. Italy, uncompromising. Scotland, undeterred. Wales, unbelievable. Unbelievable. 